The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Campbell. I am the Assistant Director for the National Adult Protective Services Association, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to today's webinar, which is hosted by the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I do want to apologize up front. I won't be doing a ton of talking, but um, I want to apologize in advance if while I'm talking, you hear my dogs barking in the background, trying to keep it under control, but you know, sometimes it's difficult at home. Um, so today's topic is related to um, operation and maintenance of elder abuse multidisciplinary teams. Next slide, please. Um, and before introducing today's speaker, I'll hand the mic over to Andy for a moment to talk about the APS TARC. Thanks, Karen. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy Capehart. I'm with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Um, a quick disclaimer before we get started. The Adult Protective Services Technical uh, Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. The contractor's findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Uh, next slide. Quick note about the APS TARC. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. Um, there'll be some contact inf information displayed at the end of the webinar. Um, we work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. And if you have questions about COVID-19, you're welcome to reach out to us as well. We're happy to provide technical assistance to programs on that. And then a quick and shameless plug for our peer-to-peer -peer calls. We have three of these calls each month for APS workers, APS supervisors, and APS administrators, respectively. You can see the schedule here on your screen. Um, if you'd like to register for these calls, just visit our webpage and click on the peer support link for details. You can also reach out to us via the email that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. So I will turn things back over to Karen. All right, thanks, Andy. So before we uh, dig in, and we have some housekeeping points, just a little bit of kind of uh, tech instructions to start off. Uh, so everyone is aware this session is being recorded and will be posted online on the APS TARCS website at a later date. You have a couple of options as to how to connect to the audio for the webinar. Um, you can, if you look at that little control panel on the right hand side of your screen that should have popped up when you joined, you can select the telephone option and dial in with those instructions, or you can select the mic and speakers on your computer. Um, everyone is, all the participants are muted for the duration of the webinar. Next slide, please. And then there are also a couple of other options on that little side panel. Um, you can enter questions over there since everyone's muted. If you have a question as we're going through, those will be monitored throughout the presentation and read aloud. Um, so you can write that into your questions box and we'll see those. And then also the slides for today's presentation are uploaded onto the software. They're available for you to download in the handout section. Next slide, please. All right, we have a quick poll. Um, Andy, would you mind launching the poll for folks? Certainly, I will launch that right now. Um, and okay. folks should see that on their screens. Um, hold on one second. There we go. All right. So you can you vote for these by clicking on your screen. Great. Thank you. And we're asking this question just to get a better idea of who's in the audience and who we're talking to. And I'll leave the poll open for about another 15 seconds. So we'll give a chance for folks to respond. And again, you can just click on your screen by voting. Let us know which of these you identify most with. And then we will, I will close that poll out now and share the results with everybody. It looks like 60% are APS professionals, 17% are other social service professional, 2% medical, 7% legal, and then 14% have classified themselves as other. I'll hide that now. We'll go back to the slides. Great, thank you, Andy. All right, so without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker for today. Um, today we have Talitha Gwynn Shaver, and she is the Elder Abuse Multidisciplinary Team Technical Advisor 
for the Elder Justice Initiative at the United States Department of Justice. Um, we're very excited to have you presenting for us today. So thank you, Talitha, and I will hand it off to you now. Thank you so much, Karen. I appreciate being asked to um, be on this webinar today. Um, here at the Elder Justice Initiative, we are housed within the U.S. Department of Justice, and our mission is to support the programmatic efforts to combat elder abuse and neglect and financial fraud and scams that target older adults. So the NCT Technical Assistance Center is housed within this project. And our mission is to support everyone who's on elder abuse NDGs across the country. And we do that in a variety of ways. Um, we try to connect people to the tools and resources that they need as they encounter um, challenges and barriers with their team. We also provide educational opportunities such as this webinar. Um, we develop resources where we find that there are gaps in the field. And we also um, have, we facilitate consultations, in-person consultations, remote consultations, and regional um, workshops and webinars. So we're trying to do a lot to support the field, and we are here for all of you who are on NDT teams. As we go through the slides today, it's important to note that our project is specifically geared toward elder abuse case review teams. The majority of what we talk about will um, apply to any sort of multidisciplinary team, but some of it will be specific to case review. And um, Andy, did you want to go ahead and launch this next poll? <clears throat> because we only have an hour together and there's so much happening in the world, we'd like to get an idea of what information is most important to all of you to, to gather here today. Certainly, I have launched that poll for us and folks are now voting. Um, you can just click on your screen um, like you did earlier. I know we had a couple of folks that had trouble clicking on their screen, but it looks like it's working for most. We're getting quite a few answers rolling in. We'll give it about 10 more seconds and then I will close that out and share the results with everyone. Again, you can vote by just clicking directly on your screen, the one that um, is most important to you today. All right, and I will now close that out, share the results with everyone. 42% said general info about sustaining an MDT, 39% info about common MDT challenges, and 20% info about um, helping your team adapt during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, thank you so much. That is very helpful. So we'll try to um, balance our time today. We'll touch on all of these topics. We'll try to stay focused on um, the information that is most valuable to you today. Um, if you are feeling like it's a little challenging to keep your head above water these days um, in the current environment we find ourselves in, you're not alone from receiving um, technical assistance calls from lots of NDTs um, asking how to best navigate this current climate and continue their work. And I wanted to touch back on my time spent in California with the San Francisco Elder Abuse Forensic Center and bring about this, um, bring up this metaphor of surfing and the skills that are needed to um, stay on top of the waves. So here's sort of the skill set and how it applies to our work. The first skill is determination, having that will to persevere. Balance is key. And right now, balance is even more important because not only do we have to remain committed to our standards of practice and committed to our clients who very much need us in this moment, but we have to also be committed to our own self-care. Um, your job on, on a daily basis is very stressful, can be very um, challenging, and not only are you carrying the weight of that job, but you're also a person living in this world, um, in this environment today, and you have to prioritize your, yourself as we do this work, which I think for social workers and other in helping fields can be a little challenging to do, so try to remember to find that balance. Um, flexibility is also key, and the way that applies to our work is having the willingness to incorporate new technologies, partnerships, and perspectives. This is really true of MCTs always, um, but right now as we are trying on new ways to stay in contact with one another and with our clients, this is going to be very much needed. And strength. Strong MCTs have strong relationships. And finding ways to maintain those relationships with your partners right now is really essential. And endurance. So I think we are all becoming aware of the fact that the challenges that we are experiencing today 
are likely to persist. Um, and we have to have the resolve to persist along with them and adapt the solutions um, to the field as it changes. So I thought it might be useful to talk about things that some teams are doing to respond to the current challenges. I think that events as of late have sort of shined the spotlight on some of the challenges that we have in our field. Some of the things that were beneath the surface are um, bubbling up a bit more and becoming more apparent. So there are some MDPs who have decided to shift their focus to try to work on some of these larger issues that really run underneath the work that we've been doing in our day-to-day -day elder justice um, roles. So we have teams that are forming around countering ageism, looking at new languaging that can be used, looking at um, reframing how we think about aging in this country. Also highlighted now are some of the gaps in the safety net. So it's just becoming more pronounced. And we have teams that are taking up either policy or the protocol initiatives to see how they can better shore up our safety net. And the news frequently has been a lot of information about the standards of care and long-term care facilities. And I have seen some teams that have not previously done work in this area um, partner with new organizations and new entities to see what can be done together to increase the standards of care in these facilities and or to prosecute facilities that are refusing to provide adequate care for their clients. We also see teams that are looking towards the future and saying, we need to develop a better safety plan, a better action plan for similar future emergencies. And then there are other MVPs that have decided to dig in and maintain their work and as far as they are able, and so this next section is going to have some things that you might consider if your team wants to continue doing the client-centered work that you have been doing already. So first and foremost, um, the consideration has to do with how we're going to interact with our older adult clients. We've seen teams that have decided to try to reduce the number of professionals who have face-to-face -face contact with older adults. And they're doing this through team coordination. So in the past, if you've ever sat in on any educational webinars or conferences where EJI has been presenting, or our initiative has been presenting, we always talk about how wonderful it is to be coordinated case visits where you have more than one professional going into a client's home and asking questions so that you can reduce the trauma that some of a client having to repeat their story over and over so you can glean information to see the client in a more holistic way by looking at it through the lens of various professionals. And those teams, those enhanced teams who have been doing coordinated um, home visits, are really having to examine that approach currently. It's not working um, the way that it was designed to. So we're prioritizing the health and well-being um, in the immediate and working together to see what information one professional can glean by doing a home visit when they are necessary. We see them uh, trying to maintain phone calls with their clients if necessary between visits in triaging cases so that you're only having face-to-face -face contact in emergencies. And if you decide to take that approach, it's important to consider defining what those emergency needs are and what the conditions of contact are so that everyone is on the same page and isn't um, out there on their own trying to figure out what best practices they need to be employing. Hey, and Talitha? Today, yes. Oh, I'm so sorry for interrupting. I just wanted to let you know, we're getting a little bit of feedback in the questions box that um, the audio on your end is coming across as a little bit low or muffled. Um, would you mind trying getting a little closer to your microphone or kind of adjusting to sure. see if it helps? Thank you. Does this, does this sound better? It sounds better to me. Would folks mind writing into that questions box to let us know? Okay, I'll continue and just let me know if I need to um, make another adjustment. I have my microphone pinned to my shirt, but maybe it's not pinned in the right place, so I'm gonna hold it. <laughs> People, a lot of folks are writing and saying they can hear you well now. Um, okay, much easier okay. to understand. Okay, so my apologies, my apologies for the muffledness. Um, we're gonna continue. So 
um, those who are having contact are obviously thinking about best practices for safe contact using safe distances, gloves, and masks. And for more information on guidelines around this, you can see the CDC's website on COVID-19. Um, I think all across the board in multiple industries, we have all these people who are suddenly being asked to work from home and do telecommuting, and this is a new world for many of us. And so I want to throw out some considerations for MDTs who are looking to incorporate remote work. So specifically working within your team to have those internal communications, but these tips will also apply to those who are considering taking on telehealth, which is a much greater challenge. So these tips will be um, inclusive for both of these perspectives. Telehealth is much more complex, and I'll mention some resources at the end of this section if you decide to go that route to have remote contact with your clients, not just with one another. So the first piece of this is going to be to choose the appropriate platform for your work. And this is when having a team collaboration can really be useful because you may have partners who already have licensing for certain teleconferencing software, um, so they can help share the cost, so that they can, um, so you can put forward platforms that maybe your users are more familiar with to cut down on that learning curve, um, people using platforms for the first time. And we've seen that some agencies have decided to contribute their platform as sort of an in-kind contribution to the team. So taking on the cost of it and um, taking on training folks and how to use it and letting that be one of the, con um, the contributions that they are making to their MDT. I think the thing that is foremost in people's mind when they go down this route is confidentiality. So while um, I am representing a government agency, I cannot recommend any particular platform or company, but I want to give you some information that can help you make good choices. So the first thing to know is that most video conferencing platforms, all of the ones that you're familiar with out in the world, people are doing these um, video conferencing, et cetera, most of them have four pay tiers that are HIPAA compliant. So most of them have four pay tiers that are HIPAA compliant. So if you're looking at using one of these tools to contact the technical support for the platforms to go to the website and sit around and see which tier it is that is providing the level of safety and security that you need for the work that you're intending to do. And most importantly, once you select a platform and you select a tier, complying with the security protocols is essential to be effective. I think there have been quite a few um, news stories lately of conferences being hacked and um, you know, information being shared in a way that it should not have been shared. And the majority of these issues have actually come about because people were either using the wrong tool, either using the, the wrong, had the wrong tier, the wrong security um, tier, or they were not using the tool correctly. So making sure that you understand the security settings of the platform that you're going to use is critical. And I've also seen teams who have decided to add additional language to their confidentiality agreement to cover remote communication. If you decide to do this, you'll need to go through the same process that you went through to develop your uh, initial confidentiality agreement to bring in those partners who had a say in that the attorneys and prosecutors or um, the representation for the various agencies. Um, whoever it is that you had at the table previously is going to be critical to bring into this conversation so that you're not just ad hoc adding in language that you're hoping would be useful. There are lots of ways that you can enhance the security for these platforms once you've decided which one you want to use and which tier you need for your work. <clears throat> a lot of these, like the um, webinar platform that we have today, have things like waiting rooms where you can accept participants into a meeting once they have gathered. And that adds an additional layer of security as to who can access the content. Um, in these waiting rooms or these um, holding places for these platforms, you can often display your confidentiality agreement language um, and utilize group chat functions to confirm participants have read, understood, and agreed to um, the confidentiality statement that has been displayed. 
You also have the ability to kick participants for non-compliance or maintain any records of um, the chat when people have agreed to the um, terms for your record. Um, here are some just general tips, tips for enhancing security when doing any sort of teleconferencing, um, telecommuting, video chatting. The first is do not use open Wi-Fi. So if you're working from home and you don't have a password on your Wi-Fi, add a password. And that will prevent and add these extra barriers so people can't get onto your network. Um, most of us shouldn't be in public spaces right now, but some members of your team may not be able to avoid it. You may have law enforcement that have to be um, at work. You may have um, medical professionals that are working in hospital or clinic settings and have to be there. And so if they are calling in to one of your meetings, it's important for them to know that you should not hold your calls in a public space. You need to find a quiet corner, a place where no one's around, where people can't see your screen um, or overhear your phone call. Another do is to keep your software updated. I know this can seem like an inconvenience to stop in your workday and update your software, but most software companies are pushing out security patches on a regular basis. So anywhere they see a deficit or um, weakness in their security, they're sending out, pushing out these patches. And so you want to keep your software updated so that you're, um, you have the most safe um, platform that you can possibly use. And also a tip is to stay current with the protocols um, and professional guidelines. So your particular agency may have protocol or guidelines around um, how to interact with one another remotely or how to interact with your clients. Staying on top of those is really critical. And also looking to your professional guidelines. So there um, have been guidelines issued for a lot of federally funded programs that you can go and you can make sure that you're doing things in accordance with their guidelines. Because this is new to everyone, I think I will just quickly go over etiquette that you can share with your team. Um, first and foremost is to test your audio and video ahead of time so that if you're going to be speaking or if you're going to be seeing that you can be sure that, um, that others on your team can hear and see you properly. Um, keep your face well lit if you're going to be visible so no light sources behind you that kind of blind the camera and make your face dark. Um, this should be obvious that as um, viral videos will show us as of late, some people do not know that they should not take their devices with them to the restroom or any place where they would not want to be seen or filmed. Um, so you can remind your team about that. A simple one, but an important one, is to mute your line when you aren't speaking. So get on to your roll call, your introductions, and then mute your line so that there's not a lot of background noise and that everyone can hear um, the speaker. And just as importantly as when you have something to contribute to, remember to unmute your line. Just like with any live meeting, you want to come to your meeting prepared, not to multitask, and to be respectful of one another's time. So again, I want to emphasize training. Make sure your team members understand how to use any new tools and resources that you're employing. And know that there are other collaborative tools that um, teams are using that you might find useful, such as shared calendars, the serve communities, instant messaging, and cloud computing. We won't go into all of those, but I do want just to touch a little bit on telehealth specifically. Virtual communication with clients is um, very complex and security is first and foremost. And so there are two resources I want to point out to you if you or one of your partner agencies is venturing out into this world of having remote contact with your clients. The first is techsafety.org. And there is a PowerPoint, I'm sorry, there's a PDF of this PowerPoint that has been made available to you as a handout. So you can click on the links in that handout instead of having to type these into your web browser. So Tech Safety is a nonprofit organization that um, serves um, social service agencies and um, professions, specifically domestic violence. And this entire company is around how to employ technology to safely interact with your clients. So they've got lots of great information on their website. 
Um, there was also a series of strategy sessions that were held on sustaining service to victims of abuse. And um, you can find those recorded sessions at reachingvictims.org. So lots of really wonderful recommendations from um, our sisters in the domestic violence field. So I think we'll pause really quickly to see if there's questions about any of that material before moving on to what we know about strong MDTs. Hello there. Um, so we did, we had a question come in um, requesting that you provide um, your agency's oper operational definition of an MDT. So a multidisciplinary team is, um, the way it's defined is anything from um, two to three professions or more that are working together on a common cause. It comes from the biopsychosocial model where you're working to um, bring about a more holistic view and to employ the professional expertise of multiple professions um, for your work. So we do have um, on our guide and toolkit, we have an MDT guide and toolkit, and we do have definitions, all sorts of definitions, including what an MDT is, what networks are, um, the work of various types of MDTs, and a host of other field-related um, definitions. And you can find that on elderjustice.gov. And I sort of summarized the definition, but you can find it written out there, and I'm happy to, I think the link to that is also at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Um, we did, we had another question come in. Um, so this question is, are there rules in place for APS I teams to continue with meetings? We have left the option open to convene a meeting if needed, but have suspended our normal quarterly meetings at this time. So is the question, is there a specific guideline for APS? Yes. Okay. I have not seen anything specific to APS come out of ACL, of the Administration for Community Living. They do have lots of guidelines for working in COVID up on their website that you can go through. So going to the Administration on Community Living's website and looking under guidelines, there, there are guidelines there, but they're not specific to adult protective services. I think what we have seen and what I have heard from teams that have been calling us the technical support is that there is not a lot of guidance and that um, states and even um, localities are making it up as they go, deciding what services are going to continue, what they can continue. Um, so these are all decisions that are being, being made by um, leadership at more of a local or state level. Great, thank you. And then one more question right now. Uh, this question is, can anyone interested in mitigating elder abuse within their community join an MDT, or do they need to be affiliated with APS or another organization specifically working on elder abuse? So it depends on what kind of multidisciplinary team you have. So there are teams that are working on outreach, education, policy, um, where they are really open to even volunteers from the community where anyone can join and have these higher level conversations about things that they are wanting to focus on to bring about positive change for older adults. Then there are teams that are very specific to the agencies that are participating in the team. So you might have closed doors um, for an enhanced MDT where you have prosecutors, law enforcement, social services, um, maybe guardianship, um, a representative from the courts or a representative from victim services. So it depends on the structure of the team that you're participating on as to who can participate and what function you're hoping to have. Most case review teams, if they're using any identifying information, are much more closed. Um, so who can be at the table and for which case they are hearing. Um, they have a lot of filters in place. And then there are those that are um, uh, open to more community service agencies where they are redacting names and identifying information and they are inviting people more broadly and speaking more theoretically. 
rather than digging into casework together when they're talking about a specific client. So this really has to do with how your team is structured and there's no right or wrong way, it's what's working for your community and helping you meet your goals. All right, great. Thank you. And we received feedback from uh, the individual who asked that last question and said thank you for the helpful response. Okay, wonderful. So let's move on to what we know about strong multidisciplinary teams in general. Let's talk about some of the fundamentals. So from research, we know that in order to set the stage for success, strong teams we need to think about um, these five areas. The first is having shared decision making. So this is where the entire team participates in the decision making processes, um, where they're sharing information, where they're sharing successes, so sort of this, this open dialogue. Now, this does not mean that any profession gives up their domain in the decisions that they are tasked by law or by policy or procedure to make. Um, so it doesn't mean that a team can decide that the DA, for instance, is going to file on a case if they feel like it's an inappropriate case. It doesn't mean that you can force APS to keep a case open if they feel they need, need to be closed. Um, but this is about having a voice into the process and everyone working together, having that shared voice into what they're going to do together. Partnership, having a strong partnership, and the best way to get at this is having strong memorandums of understanding. If you are working with other city agencies, if you are deciding to have an MVP where you're open to community service providers, if you decide that you want to focus on outreach and education or ageism issues, as we mentioned earlier, and you're wanting to invite the public more broadly into your work, having a clear understanding of what each partner is going to bring to the table, what the expectations are for them, what they can expect from the other partners is really critical to having a strong MDT. Also, this concept of interdependency. Our work is stronger when we are collaborating with others in the field who have unique professional perspectives that can broaden and deepen the work that we are doing. Our outcomes are influenced by the work of the team and recognizing that interdependence and so bringing about better case outcomes um, or to bring about um, more positive um, whatever our goals are, outreach or education, et cetera. And if we are working in this interdependent fashion, recognizing that um, these teams are shown to be stronger and more successful. Having a balance of power, and this can be challenging for MDCs because you might have a team where participants inherently because of their role or their profession have more power than others on the team. So I've seen this a lot with teams where there are prosecutors, and uh, community service providers, for example, on the same team, and that there can be a feeling of inequity and power when you come to the table to discuss cases. So good MDTs look to flatten that power hierarchy as much as possible so that while you are in this form, while you're in the setting of this team, that everyone has the ability, the capacity, the bandwidth, the approval to speak up to collaborate and to talk about um, their goals. And strong teams also have a clear process. They have worked together to develop protocols so that there's predictability and accountability around the work that you're doing together. And it's also important to have protocols around conflict resolution because we are working on tough cases when we're doing case review. This is a complex issue. We each are going to have different professional things that we can and cannot do, burdens and obligations and, um, and perspectives and different guiding professional ethics and frameworks. So having a really clear process is a cornerstone of having a strong MDT. So when I was working um, back in 2008 in San Francisco, we were launching our um, San Francisco Elder Abuse Forensic Center, and it was a new model. I was extremely green to the field in general, as were a lot of the other people who were coming together to work on this. 
And in the beginning, when we were forming our team, we had sort of this beautiful vision of what we could do together. Um, and a year into working together, that beautiful dream really felt shattered. And we had no context for what was happening to our team. So I think it's important for teams to have just a very basic understanding of team development, um, of team dynamics. A lot of the professions who come to the team will have a lot of education in their specific discipline that are not well-versed in what it takes to make a team function. And so exploring this um, as part of your foundational activities is really valuable. I wish we had, would have known what we were going through when we were going through it. So just very briefly, there are four main stages of team development. Forming, that's when you're deciding who's going to come to the table and what you're going to do together. There's storming, right? You've had this idea of what you're going to do together. Once you actually start trying to do it together, there are going to be challenges. There's going to be obstacles, barriers. People are going to have misunderstandings about what they're doing there, what their contribution is supposed to be, disagreements on how to reach your goals. And this can be, um, there can be a sense of upheaval in your team as you're sorting through these things. This is a very critical and normal stage of team development. And what it leads to is norming where you decide how best to proceed in a normal case scenario, what your team is usually going to do, um, and you're developing those policy and protocol to put all of that into action. And once all of that happens, you hit ideally this beautiful um, stage of human development where you're performing, right? Everybody knows why they're there, they know what they're doing, they have hashed through most of those big challenges um, in forming your team, they know what to expect, and you're sort of clicking along um, and doing your case review or your outreach or whatever it is that you've come together to do. It's important to note that this is not necessarily a linear process, that at any point in this process, your team can go back to a stage that had previously already been through. And all of this is normal. It's just important to recognize where your team is and where you want it to be so you can get back to performing if at all possible. I want to get into some of the components that make a team strong. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the first is defining clearly your mission, your vision, and your goals. Um, what's the purpose of your team? How are you going to work together? What are you going to do? And we have a chapter in our MVP guide and toolkit that's specifically on building a strong foundation. Part of building that strong foundation is the development of your organizational rules. There are many components of this, and so I've tried to provide at least one resource for each of these points. So clearly understanding what your state laws and statutes are and agreeing upon the interpretation of your state laws and statutes is critical. So law is all about interpretation. So you might have a prosecutor or an attorney or a political figure that is looking at the same law as a, their counterpoint, their counterpart in maybe another county within the same state, another jurisdiction, and they're seeing the law differently. So understanding within your house, within your jurisdiction, the laws that govern what you're doing and what the agreed upon interpretation of these laws it so will save you a lot of headaches. And to help you with this process, we do an annual statutory review state by state. You can go click on it, look for your state, and see the laws around multidisciplinary teams in one place. You can also compare your state's work to other states. And we have seen some teams decide to work on changing um, policy or changing law based on what they're seeing other states do. <clears throat> Part of developing the, the, the strong foundation is identifying someone to serve as a coordinator. Teams without a coordinator struggle much more than teams who have a person who is tasked with coordination of the team. This is more than an administrative position. Uh, we have a chapter about the MVP coordinator because it is very complex. You're looking for a very unique skill set someone who can 
um, have positive inter, um, um, interpersonal communication across the board with different personality types, people in different positions, with different levels of power, who can bring those people together around a common cause, um, who can help with conflict resolution, who can um, be the day-to-day -day glue that's holding the team together, getting everyone to the table and working through the challenges with the team. So this is a unique position. We have more information about that there. Also on our website, we have information about how to use VOCA funding to fund the position of a coordinator if your team does not have one. Um, mentioned creating MOUs. That can be a challenging thing to do. So, and we have a chapter on ethical and legal considerations. And you can look at MOUs that other teams have created, memorandums of understanding, those um, documents for partnering with other agencies or organizations. Um, we also have a bunch of downloads on how to write your protocols. We have examples of what other teams are doing and how they're doing it as a starting place for your team. And then in general, chapter four has lots of great information about building a strong foundation. Another thing that we know about strong MVPs is that they understand that this is not a, um, a one-time thing. You don't create a team, decide what you're doing, and then it works forever. You have to continually just um, refine what you're doing. And it's very helpful to have mechanisms to evaluate your team's performance so you can make adjustments as needed. It's also going to require commitment of time, resources, staff, um, and, and other aspects of your team that are going to have to be used in an ongoing, continual manner, not just one time. Strong teams keep their team members informed. So looking at ways you can keep your team informed and trying to incorporate that into your communications with your team, either inside of a meeting, as a newsletter, um, however it is that you want to structure your communication with your team, but making people aware of new changes and policy and protocol for your team, um, changes in the political landscape as things shift, um, changes that, um, or evolution of a particular field. So you might have conferences, webinars that are going to help your GA dig into elder abuse. You might have um, educational webinars for APS. Um, trying to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening professionally and providing resources to your team so they can stay abreast of these changes. Um, on our website, we have a bunch of webinars. We have MDT-specific webinars, and we also have webinars for the various professions that likely participate on MDTs, like prosecutors, like victim advocates, etc. And Chapter 7 of our MVP guide and toolkit has lots of information about meeting your cross, the cross-training and professional development needs of your team members. Strong teams cultivate trust. Um, the best way to do this is to get to know each other personally. Again, having those strong, clear collaboration documents like your MOUs so that everyone knows what to expect and contribute really taking the time to actively listen in your teams, to have that be part of the foundation of your team, that you're going to try to um, reach out to the team members who maybe don't speak up as much. They're often the observers on the team, and they usually have wonderful insights because they're listening deeply and instead of talking, and so finding a way to bring them into the conversation. If you have those team members that dominate the conversation and talk a lot, um, asking them to share that space so that you can get the perspective of everyone at the table. It's another way to um, generate trust. Ad addressing problems and conflicts head on and promptly. Um, holding one another accountable kindly. So especially if you're going to be working on a case together and everyone has agreed on different tasks that they will do, making sure that you're following up on those tasks and seeing that they're being done without being heavy handed, without reporting back to the team whenever you have additional meetings, et cetera, so that people can stay on, on track. Um, blame never helps trust, it never helps teams. It can be tempting to look at an individual or an agency or an organization and say that's where the problem is. And sometimes you might actually be right about that. 
but it really helps move the team forward, move your cases forward, move your goals forward if you can stay focused on solutions and supporting one another's work. And um, a couple other tips are to get in the trenches together, work a case together. Um, there's nothing that builds trust more than seeing your colleagues work with you to make um, to make something better, whether it's a case that you're working on or whatever um, task you have chosen to do together. I think it dispels a lot of myths that we have about other professions when we grapple with these challenging issues together. And to stay focused on your clients, remember why you're here. <clears throat> Briefly, you want to just sprinkle in some meeting facilitation tips, tips for your team. Um, things that we see strong teams do naturally um, or sometimes because they realize they haven't been doing it and they have to jump in there and do it. So just some quick tips. Develop a meeting structure. Yes, your, your team meetings are going to be the heart of your multidisciplinary team, but you need to communicate outside of meetings, having respectful communication, being mindful and respectful of everyone's time and organizational limitations. When you have success, sharing that success, um, tending to those on, ongoing training and education needs and refining the procedures, keeping in mind cultural differences between professions, having clear goals and a shared vision, and providing opportunities for members to get to know each other better. So here are a few tips for those first two sections and additional resources. Um, again, reiterating the techsafety.org and reachingvictims.org, um, also the CDC's um, link for coronavirus-related guidance, um, and the elderjustice.gov website where you can find all of our MDT resources, and uh, justice.gov where you can get the department's perspective on the coronavirus. So we can pause here and um, see if there's any questions about this material so far. Absolutely. So we had one question come in. Um, the question is, who are the recommended members of an MDT? So if you go to our guidance <laughs> toolkit, we have um, a list of the common players. So it depends on what type of team you have and what your goals are. If you're talking about an elder abuse case review team, the typical participants would be adult protective services, um, police, sheriff, other law enforcement prosecutors, sometimes um, there will be civil attorneys that will participate. Um, if you have a guardianship agency, um, sometimes they'll participate. Some have ombudsmen's participating, victim advocates. So it depends on what your goals are for your team. If you're looking at case review, you want to have people at the table who can actually move a case forward. The investigation and potential prosecution of a case, you need the right people at the table for that. If you're doing education and outreach, um, you want to have experts that understand elder abuse, but they can come from a variety of places, community service providers, adult protective services, um, maybe a partner in the world of domestic violence who understands domestic violence in later life, and um, members from the community who can recognize maybe where there are gaps in communication with specific populations where you might need materials translated, where there are groups of people who are maybe less aware of financial abuse, for example, or um, where there is a need for greater education for the community at large. So it depends on what your goals are for the team and what type of team structure you have. Um, but you can go to the, the guiding toolkit and see not only what common professions are, but what they can contribute to the team. Great, thank you. And then another question, um, how do you best handle staff turnover with partner agencies? Staff, oh, staff turnover is a huge thing for MDTs. Um, especially case review teams where you have partners in law enforcement and, and prosecutors offices and medical professionals because you will have people who get reassigned to different divisions who get promoted um, and there is going to be turnover within these agencies 
the best way to cope with that is to have those well-developed clear protocols and procedures for your team and have built-in mechanisms for bringing new members up to speed um, on those policies and procedures as you, um, as you move forward and as new people come in. There's also a positive aspect of having that, that team turn over, especially when um, you're talking about law enforcement prosecutors and social services. There's so much learning that happens within a multidisciplinary team. Understanding elder abuse from the perspective of all the professionals at the table is going to elevate the work that you do no matter what your professional background is. And if you have people come to that understanding, gain that knowledge, and then move up in their um, agency or uh, move to a different division within their agency, they are taking that knowledge with them as they go. And you're having the opportunity to bring in others and help them level up their education on these issues as well. So it can be challenging because just when you feel like you've got everything going and you've got the right people at the table, that right person will up and go. And I've been on um, the receiving end of that many, many, many times. It can be frustrating. Um, but again, stay focused on your protocol, your policy, your education of your team, and try to stay focused again on the positive that information going out further into the field. Great, thank you. And we did have a few more questions come in, but I think um, to be mindful of time, uh, quite a few of them I think could be addressed by this next section. So I'll save them until the end, read them aloud if they aren't, don't end up getting addressed. That sounds good. And um, just to be in keeping with my own tips of being mindful about time, this next section I'm going to just very briefly go over so we have a little time for a Q&A. But when we're talking about overcoming challenges, I um, just want to direct people to, our, again, our guide and toolkit, and also to using the MDT Resource Center as um, a resource that we're here for you. We can help you go through those challenges. There are lots of challenges that are really common to MDTs, and then there are challenges that are going to be really unique to the community and the environment in which you are working. And there's no one blueprint for MDT. We know what makes a, a strong MDT from the section that we read before, and that's research-based. If you want to find the, um, the research materials that went into that, we have all the citations available um, online at our, with our guide and toolkit. You can look chapter by chapter at our resources. So we know what makes a team strong, but how a team is structured and the problems that are going to come up for that team are unique, and it has to be flexible in our thinking. Um, so that they can best address these issues and make changes as they go because changes are going to be happening all around you. When you run into challenges, it can be helpful to have a framework for examining the root cause of those challenges. I invite you all to look at problems and issues that come up as being symptomatic of something else instead of being the, the, the um, problem in totality. So let's just take a very common um, challenge, um, people not showing up and participating in meetings. There could be many reasons for that. I think a lot of us want to go to an assumption this person doesn't care or their agency doesn't care or they don't get it um, or whatever our story is about why people are not participating. But if we're willing to examine it from various perspectives, we might come to a better understanding of the root cause of this challenge and of many others. So I'm just going to briefly define these challenges and then we'll just move on so we can answer questions. But I want you to think about logistical issues. Where, when you're having your meeting, the accessibility of your meeting, that could have a lot to do with why people aren't participating. You might have structural issues. Um, this would be about your framework, your affiliation, your purpose, your leadership, your roles, the structure of the team. Again, if you're thinking about that one particular challenge of people not participating or any other challenge, looking at it from the structural issue, are there ways that we can structure the work that we are doing where we are more likely to get the participation that we need? Do we need changes in our framework, our affiliation? Do we need to look at our mission and our, our purpose again? Do we need to think about bringing in someone in leadership who has a different skill set? 
procedural issues. So this is again, all of the, the technical stuff that you're gonna pull together about how you're gonna work together, how you're gonna run your meetings, what your intake process is like, um, your case flow, your, your goals, and, and all of that good juicy stuff. So how you work together. And a lot of times we see taking the same example, we're just going to do one challenge through all of these and see how it could have different um, root causes. So if people aren't participating, they may not have a clear understanding of what is being asked of them. They may think that their MOUs are weak and not providing enough protection for themselves or for their clients. They may not understand which kinds of cases you're seeing or what your intake process is like. So you want to look at the procedural issues you have in place and see if there's a correction that can be made there that will minimize some of the challenges that you're having. Cultural issues are huge, and cultural issues are about an evolving set of collective beliefs, values, attitudes, behaviors, rules, dynamics. When you talk about culture, you can be talking about routine culture. We can talk about the culture of the various professions that are sitting at the table. The culture of law enforcement is very different from the world of um, adult protective services and the culture that you have there. Again, very different from the medical field and the culture that um, is there. <clears throat> so looking at the cultural issues and seeing where there are perhaps misunderstandings, where you can clarify roles, um, where you can clarify what organizations can and can't do, where you can clar clarify their um, ethical framework, or the laws that govern them, so looking, or even the language that they're speaking. So we can all be talking about a client that law enforcement is going to be using different terminology than APS or um, a prosecutor. And then political issues. So this is how your team navigates power, authority, social networks, and influencers. Um, there can be many political issues that would contribute to, again, the same issue of maybe people not participating. So are they being told to go to a meeting just so they can say that they're participating? Um, do they not have the authority to do the things that they're being asked to do in their team? Um, are there other external political factors that are making it challenging for them to participate. Maybe there are political issues between agencies or individuals um, within those agencies that have a, a larger historical context that needs to be addressed. So whatever challenge it, it, it is that you're having, kind of trying to look at it as a symptom of a larger problem and using this framework to see where this problem might be arising from. Because if it's coming from one of these places, there's a fix. There's something that you can adjust in how you're doing or what you're doing um, to address those, those issues. <clears throat> you can look at your handout just to get more information about what each of these issues is, uh, are composed of and some of the common challenges that arise in, um, in those areas. I want to just quickly point out that Again, there are services available to you through the MVP Technical Assistance Center. We do phone consultations. Um, I've done a lot of cluster trainings, regional trainings, individual trainings, webinars. We have lots of resources online, so I don't want you to feel like you're alone in this work. If you have questions about MVPs, um, the Elder Justice Initiative is here for you. And here is my contact information. Um, sorry for the very long email address, but that's how it is at the Department of Justice. Every part of your name has to be in there, and I have a long name. Um, but I do respond to email very quickly. So I'm going to turn it over now. Um, Karen, are there other questions? Yes, we did have um, another question come in. Um, I just want to note this slide that's up right now has the contact information for the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, if you'd like to reach out to them. Um, so a question that came in was, could you touch more on case review models or case-specific MDT models? Um, well, it's it was probably the best in the amount of time that we have to refer you to the MVP guide and toolkit, but we are going to continue to address the questions that have come in. Um, there are going to be emails to me. I'm happy to get back to you. There are lots of different models for case review MDTs. Um, so you have some that are going to be interagency or interagency. 
Um, you might have a medical legal partnership who's going to case review. You might have a case review team that just is in adult protective services. Um, and it really depends on what you're trying to do as to what type of model you should look at. The one that I usually tell the most is an enhanced multidisciplinary team where you're bringing in legal and medical professionals in addition to law enforcement prosecutors and adult protective services and where you are task focused. So you're going to talk about a case, you're all going to know who you're talking about or have some um, method of communicating that to those who need to know at the table and you're going to look at what needs to happen in the case and you each can take a piece of it and carry the weight. And so these are various ways to accomplish that, but these are enhanced MVPs, and that's the one that I usually talk about the most. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, being mindful of time, I will read one more of the questions that came in. The question is, do services include team building trainings? So yes, we have done some of that. Um, so in Upstate New York a couple of years ago, we did um, a training with, I think it was five or six um, MDTs from various counties who brought them together. And we go through team building exercises and plot exercises looking at your strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. Whether you have somebody from our organization provide that training, or you decide to do um, something local with the leadership locally, it can be really helpful to have a working retreat like this or a session like this because you're getting in and bringing everybody together and you're fleshing out any of the challenges that you have together, looking at how you can work better together as a team and, um, and learning how to work better together. Those team dynamics, um, the, the stages of team development, the role that people play, all of that. Again, that's an area where a lot of MDCs have a deficit because they have professional expertise, but not expertise in how to do things. So we're happy to help with that. There's information on that in the guidance toolkit as well, and in some of the webinars that we have on our website. And we're very happy to um, conduct a training for your group on that subject as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so. Thank you, Talitha, for presenting, um, for sharing this expertise. And thanks to the APS TARC for hosting and for all of you for, um, for attending here today. As I noted at the beginning, there will be a recording posted um, in the near future on the APS TARC's website. And yeah, thank you all. And thanks, Karen. Well. If I could, this is Andy Kaport, if I could say one last thing real quick. Um, if any. If anyone's interested in reading up on, um, you know, what's happening with COVID-19 and adult protective services, our website has a page dedicated to COVID-19. You can click on that at the top, and there are links there to the Administration for Community Living's website that has a lot of updates on um, COVID-19 research as well as CDC and others. So I'll turn it back over to you, Karen. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Andy. Um, yeah, that's all we've got for you today, and so enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye, folks.